The worst extremes usually start with slight deviations. The worst extremes usually start with, the, with slight deviations. I want us to imagine that as believers we're driving down a road, and on this road, uh, the road says biblical truth on it, okay? And as a new believer, we're excited, we're wanting to grow in our understanding of Scripture, a biblical truth, but then somewhere along the line, you see a sign. And that sign has, uh, it, it takes you on another path, and, and on that sign, it says something more, something more. And uh, the temptation might be in the Christian life to think, well, I might want that something more. I might want to go down that path. Well, uh, to perhaps take that side street that promises something more in the Christian life. Well, that side street could be a video on YouTube where someone is promoting something extra biblical. It might be a podcast or a book that looks good on the outside, but when you begin to take it in, you find that its message is really enslaving. Um, Don't forget it, that that side street with the sign promising something more will always be filled with detours, dead ends, and giant potholes that can derail you in the Christian life. It can derail you in the Christian life from being effective for the Lord's purposes. Don't forget it. The worst extremes usually start with slight deviations. And Satan is so subtle in in his approach to captivate the minds and the hearts of those who are who are not grounded in biblical truth. And and there are many today who have deviated from a a biblical understanding of spiritual gifts to accept an unbiblical view of the roles that might support the apostles and prophets. Well, there are ministries out there today that believe that apostles and prophets are for today. And they will argue that those roles are for the church in this church age of grace. Um, But as we work our way through this, as we begin to look at the apostles and prophets this morning, we're going to find this truth to be true, which is that it is the purpose of God to reveal himself through the word rather than beyond the word. It is the purpose of God to reveal the word, uh, to reveal himself through the word rather than beyond the word. And it's a, it's a slippery slope that believers can begin to go down uh, if, if they would take that side street that promises something more. And as I mentioned already during our time together, we're going to examine two spiritual gifts listed in this passage of Scripture, um, in, in the passage of Scripture that details the gifts of the Spirit. And the first gift that we're going to examine in our time together will be Apostle. We're going to begin our time by looking at that of the apostle. Now, there are people that believe that this gift is for today. Um, They will make their arguments. They will uh, try to convince their listeners that there are apostles today. You'll hear that. Uh, The Greek word for apostle is apostolos. It's found 79 times in the New Testament. It's found nine times in the Gospels. 28 times in the book of Acts, three times in Galatians, one time in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 16 times in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, three times in Romans, six times in Paul's first imprisonment epistles, five times in Paul's pastoral letters, one time in Hebrews, three times in 1st and 2nd Peter, one time in Jude, and three times in Revelation. And I've looked at every usage of that, that Greek word in the New Testament, and I am convinced that that is a gift, um, that this is, this is a gift that is not being given by God in this church age of grace today uh, within the body of Christ. However, the, this observation does not take away from the importance of this gift. In fact, in the New Testament, the gift of apostle was the highest ranked gift that a man could have. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, we read, And God has appointed in the church first apostles. Just note that. First apostles, second prophets. You'll also find that same order in, in the book of Ephesians, in chapter 4, verse 11. This Greek word for apostle means messenger or one who is sent on a mission. Messenger or one who is sent on a mission. 
And typically, if a messenger was sent out, uh, their purpose would be to arrange something. They would uh, have the purpose of setting something up. And to get to that question, uh, the question really is, what, what would an apostle need to set up? What would an apostle need to arrange? And to get to that, uh, that question, we need to observe uh, three components of the spiritual gift. And that's what we're going to do in our time together. We're going to look at these three components of the spiritual gift, that of the apostle. And the first uh, component that we need to observe is its extent. We need to observe its extent. There are various ways in which this Greek word is used in the New Testament. One way that it is used is as an office. You'll note that in, in the scripture. You'll see that this gift is used as an office. If you would, turn with me to Luke chapter 6. We're going to go to the New Testament, uh, the Gospel of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We'll go to Luke chapter 6, Luke chapter 6, verse 13. Luke chapter 6, verse 13. In the context here, Jesus will officially name his disciples, and he's going to, he's going to call them apostles. And please note that uh, we will be reading verse 13, followed by a list of disciples who were personally selected by Jesus Christ for a unique and special position, or we would say office, during the foundational period of the church. So, so if you would read along with me, Luke chapter 6, verse 13 says, And when day came, he called his disciples to him and chose twelve of them, whom he also named as apostles. And of course, we know that those twelve uh, disciples were then selected personally by who? By Jesus. That is something to note. They are personally selected by Jesus Christ for this position or this office. Apostolos is also used in the New Testament as a messenger. So we have seen that this word has been used as a position or office. Now we also see that it's, it's uh, also used as a messenger in Philippians 2, verse 25, this Greek word is used to describe, uh, it would be used to describe Epaphroditus, and in that verse, Epaphroditus has been described as just that, a messenger. He's described as a messenger. Then, of course, we find that apostolos, uh, apostle, that Greek word apostle, has been used in the, the spiritual gifts passages of Scripture as well, indicating to us that this is a in fact, a gift given to us by, by God. So there are various ways in which this word has been used throughout the New Testament. And like anything, if you want to draw proper biblical conclusions, then the context will steer you in the right direction. Which brings us to our second component connected to this gift. And that second component is its qualities. Its qualities. The gift of apostle has been given to those who were part of a particular office or position that had been personally hand-selected by Jesus Christ himself. And at, at, at this point, point in our series, I want to encourage you, if you've not done this already, I'd like to encourage you to go to our YouTube page. Um, you can check out uh, lesson number 11. If you go to YouTube, you can type in our church. Uh, go to the, uh, our church's page, and on our church's page, you can click on Playlists. And we, we have our messages, our sermons uh, there for you. And um, if you click on pneumatology, you can go to lesson number 11. And the reason why I would encourage you to do that is because in that lesson from this series, uh, I've already given us six reasons why the apostolic office is not for today. And you can check that out. And since the gift itself had been connected to that office, it is true that the apostolic gift is no longer functioning as it did during the foundational period of the church. For instance, the gift of an apostle had been given to one who had been an eyewitness of the resurrection. This is an undisputable fact in the early church. They were also given signed gifts or miraculous powers in order to authenticate their office of an apostle within the early church. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1 says, Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over clean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Wow, that's amazing. 
Um, if that office were still in play today, we wouldn't have a need for a hospital in Escanaba. You remember in uh, the book of Acts, chapter 5, as Peter was walking along the streets, what was it that healed the people? People were gathering all along, all, all along the side of the streets. Go ahead, read chapter 5, in Acts chapter 5. It is his shadow that's healing people. I'm not seeing that gift today. But it was there in the foundational period of the church. It was there. The qualities of this particular gift given to those who held this office or position, very unique, very special, and they had a purpose. And that brings us to our third component connected to this gift, and that would be its arrangement, its arrangement. Now, as we've noted already, uh, this is a very important gift given in the early church, and it was distinguished from those who were prophets, from those who were evangelists and pastor teachers. John Walbert observed that a, he observed a critical point when he studied the historical placement of the apostolic office. This was what John Walbert noted. He said that the apostolic office died with the first generation of Christians, there being no provision for successors, nor have there been in the history of the church any who could stand with the apostles. What an interesting observation there. They were the ones who laid the foundation for this church age of grace. And we posed the question at the beginning of our time, what would an apostle be sent out to arrange? What would he be sent out to set up? Well, the answer to that is that they were personally selected by who? Jesus Christ, they were, there's, a, there's a type of office that had been personally selected by Jesus Christ. They are no longer around anymore. Those original disciples, uh, those apostles, they were called out by Jesus Christ and they would lay the foundation of the church. They would, they, they would arrange for the establishment of the church. That is a special position. And even though there are those who claim that there, uh, that there are apostles today, I can guarantee you this, those self-proclaimed apostles do not meet the requirements for an apostle that you find in Scripture. They do not meet those requirements. But don't take my word for it. Um, when, uh, when I say that the apostles were the ones who laid the foundation for the church, is that just me talking? Uh, there's scripture to back that up. The Apostle Paul made it exceptionally clear that this was one of the purposes for the office of apostle in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, having been built on the foundation. Well, what foundation? The foundation of the church, of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone. The context of Ephesians 2, 20 is the church. It's the body of Christ. Uh, it's interesting to watch some try to explain away a very clear verse, like Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. Bethel Church, out in California, uh, they take the position that there are apostles and prophets today. And one of their members, who is a senior leader, who is on the senior leadership team within that church, will explain away what we have up here in, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. Uh, he'll explain this verse away by placing his own emphasis on the order of priority. So his argument is this, that since the apostles and prophets are expressly mentioned here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, that it is then these two offices that are the most important offices for the church. That would be his explanation. Those are the two most important offices for the church today. But what are the prophets and the apostles connected to in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20? They are connected to the foundation, the foundation period of the church. The church had a starting point in Acts chapter 2. It had a foundational period. Is the foundational period for the church being relayed in every generation? Therefore, needing this office to continue... Is the foundational period for the church being relayed in every generation? No. There's only one time where the church had a foundational period where it began. There was only one time 
where that had happened. In fact, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'd encourage you to write that verse reference down. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 7 and 9. Paul makes it very clear that his apostleship was unique, making him the last of the apostles. That's 1 Corinthians 15, verses 7 through 9. When you have those church epistles that speak of how a church is to function, you have elders, deacons. In those passages, I don't find apostles. <laughs> Something to consider. Well, that leads us to our second gift that we're going to examine together, and that's that of a prophet. A prophet. In both the Old and New Testaments, uh, a prophet was someone who received direct revelation from God in the New Testament. One of the gifts of the Spirit was uh, that they would have the ability to function as a prophet of God, known as the gift of prophecy. And now up to this point, I've mentioned uh, Bethel, uh, which is a church out in California, and they believe, again, that, that this office even, that of apostle and prophet, is for today. It's still in operation, is what they would believe. And they have a school where you can apparently activate a prophetic gift. And the name of that school is the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, where students are sent out and they go out into the Reading community and they're encouraged to prophesy to, to strangers. And it sounds a little crazy, but it's true. They will send their students to fairs and public areas where they will set up booths pretending to be physics or excuse me, psychics, where they will offer dream interpretations, spirit readings, and hope that they can blend new age, blend into the new age crowd. And uh, this practice of activating people in a prophetic gift is one of many that Bethel Church shares in common with the new age idea of awakening occult-like abilities. According to Holly Pivek, uh, she wrote, um, Counterfeit Kingdom, and I'd like to mention that is a, an outstanding book. I think I've mentioned it already. I would encourage you to read it. This is what Holly pointed out. More than 13,000 students have graduated from the Bethel School of the Supernatural Ministry and have taken these practices back to their home churches around the world. Former New Age participants who are now Christians report with concern that many New Agers who have come to Christ are getting drawn back into, the, into occult-like practices through the teachings of Bethel and Bethel-influenced churches. So the question is, what happened? Well, there are many churches and ministries that have gone down this side street that promises something more. It promises something more outside of God's word. Yet upon closer examination of the gift of prophecy... In light of God's word, it becomes evident that it is not a gift that remains in operation today. I want to encourage you, if you are listening online to this, if you are a pastor or an elder in a church, read that book, Counterfeit Kingdom. It'll be very helpful. Uh, but that brings us right into our first component that is connected to this gift, and that component is its nature, its nature. When John Walvard considered this particular component to the gift of prophecy, he said something that was very helpful. He stated that there is no more possibility of anyone possessing the prophetic gift in the, the present dispensation than there is of anyone writing further inspired books to be added to the canon. The word of God is so clear on the nature of this spiritual gift. If you would turn with me to 1 Corinthians, I, I'd like us to go to chapter 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we're going to just park on verse 8 for a, mo a moment. We know that the context here is of spiritual gifts. It's serving the Lord within the body of Christ. We see that in chapters 12, 13, and 14. You get to um, chapter 13, verse 8, and we learn a little something about the gift of prophecy. Let's take a note of what it, what it says here. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. They will be done away. It's pretty straightforward. Prophecy will be done away according to 1 Corinthians 13, 8. And the context is clear that this gift will be done away with what? The completion of Scripture. 
We noted in our last lesson, the um, completion of scripture there is in verse 10, um, and that this gift had a temporal aspect to it. That is its nature. It's not, not consistent today. In fact, you're playing a dangerous game if you believe that you can add on or take away from the word of God according to Revelation 22, verses 18 through 19. So the nature of this gift is very clear. This is a gift that will be in operation during that foundational period, but will be done away with at the completion of the scriptures, its nature. Its characteristics, we also want to know its characteristics. In the New Testament, the gift of prophecy was one of the spiritual gifts that allowed individuals to function as a prophet of God, and they shared certain traits with the Old Testament prophet. For instance, they spoke on behalf of God, warning of judgment for sin, delivering messages as if from God, and addressed both current and future events. The New Testament prophet partook of some of those characteristics of the Old Testament prophet, who was someone who received direct revelation from God. The prophets of the Old Testament were tasked with speaking on behalf of God and warning the people of judgment for sin. They delivered messages that were believed to be from God, and these messages address both current and future events, which we witness together in our study through the book of Jeremiah. In the same way, the New Testament prophet was also responsible for speaking on behalf of God, warning of judgment upon sin, delivering messages as if from God, and addressing both current and future events. So then, by sharing some of the traits of the Old Testament prophet, the New Testament prophet was able to continue the tradition of divine communication with the people of God, building upon the foundation laid in the Old Testament. However, there are differences between the Old Testament prophet and the New Testament prophet. Um, we note that John Wavard explains here that the Old Testament prophet often had a character of a national leader, reformer, or patriot, and delivered his message normally to Israel. The New Testament prophet has no national characteristics. His message is individual and personal. It revealed the will of God, which otherwise might have been unknown, meeting the need, which later was to be filled by the written New Testament. So to put it plainly, the Old Testament prophets were often leaders who spoke to the people of Israel. And the New Testament prophets spoke to individuals and revealed God's will. But this role is now filled by what? It's filled by the word of God. We have everything that we need for life and living right here. We don't need something more. Don't go down that, that road. We don't need something more. We have it right here. Um, that opens us up right into our third component that's connected to this gift, and that third component is its elements. Its elements. To have the gift of prophecy, three elements were necessary. For starters, the message was required to have come from God through revelation. Secondly, the prophet must be guided by God in speaking the message, corresponding to the inspiration of the written word. And thirdly, the message must have the authority as being from God. So a true prophet would be required to deliver a message free from error, a product not of his own mind, but a revelation from God. And, and we highlight these things because just like in the Old Testament today, there are people running around claiming to have some special message from God today. But when you listen to those messages, they don't square with sound doctrine. And there are many messages out there that don't square with the written word of God. God warned his people who were living in Judah uh, of this very thing. Don't forget Jeremiah chapter 29, which says in verses 8 and 9, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners deceive you and do not listen to the dreams which they dream. For they, fa they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. There are people out there today who call themselves prophets and apostles and God says, don't listen to them. Those false prophets in the days of Jeremiah led the people of God away from the blessings of God. They were guilty of sugarcoating sin. They were uh, about elevating that which sounded good. They tickled the ears of their listeners. And if the Bible teaches us anything, 
it's that God takes his written word very seriously. He takes his messages seriously, and he does not want his children to get caught up in listening to false messages. He doesn't want that for his people. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, if a prophet from the Old Testament claimed to have a message from God and that message didn't come true, do you realize what they did to that prophet? They'd kill him. They would kill him. That's how serious this was to God in the Old Testament. This tells me that God's people today have no business listening to false prophets, especially those who have stated that something will happen, and it didn't happen. Holly Pivak uh, pointed out in her book, Counterfeit Kingdom, that many high-profile prophets and apostles predicted that Donald Trump would be reelected to a second term in 2020. You guys remember that, right? We saw that. We watched that whole thing go down. Well, those messages didn't come true, did they? So what are we to do in the middle of that? What are we to do when someone claims that something will happen in the future and then it doesn't happen? Here's what you do. You take note of who they are. You write them down on a list. And then you never listen to them again. That's what you do. That's what you do. Holly Pivik went on to say that those false prophecies that concerned the re-election of Donald Trump brought, and these are her words, those false prophecies brought, in her words, shame to the church, injured the church's witness to the world, and undermined the faith of believers. I think she's absolutely right with that assessment when you look at what happened there. God is not a God of confusion. In fact, when you read through 1 Corinthians chapter 14, you will find that God actually gave specific guidelines to the church as to how the gift, how this specific gift was to function within the early church. And we don't have enough time to turn there, but uh, I would encourage you to write this verse reference down. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 1 Corinthians 14, verses 29 through 32. Those are the gifts of a pro, uh, those are the guidelines for prophecy in, in the early church. That would be 1 Corinthians 14 verses 29 through 32. Well, that brings us to our fourth and final component, which is its necessity, its necessity. During the apostolic period, within the first century, the New Testament had not yet been written, and there was an imperative need for an authoritative source of revelation for the will of God to guide the church as they would move forward. In response to this, God gave prophets the supernatural gift of prophecy to provide authoritative revelation of his will to help guide the church within that foundational period. So this role of the prophets during this time was crucial in helping the church to maintain doctrinal purity despite the fact that many of the first of the first generation of Christians did not live to see the day of the completed scriptures. By possessing the supernatural gift of prophecy, the prophets were able to provide the church with a direct line of communication with God. Again, a very unique time, a very unique time. And their teaching helped to provide clarity concerning God's will concerning God's will and in understanding God's will. Overall, the prophetic gift was essential in the apostolic period as it helped the church to navigate through a time of significant transition and helped to establish the church within that foundational period, within this church age of grace. Listen, as a pastor here of this church who loves this flock, all right, I need to say that the only prophets who exist today, the only prophets that exist today are false prophets. They are false prophets. Don't pay any attention to them. If they are self-proclaimed, they are false prophets. Pastor David Thompson pointed out that the gift of prophecy was a foundational gift and has long passed off the scene. Those who claim they get direct messages from God today are false. The Apostle John stated it so well in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, that many false prophets have gone out into the world. And again, we recognize that this very special gift was given during the foundational period of the church and that it would eventually be done away with at the completion of God's word. 
And in every instance in the Bible, a prophet received direct revelation from God, and no pastor, teacher, or evangelist receives direct revelation from God. A preacher proclaims God's word. He proclaims God's word. A teacher teaches God's written word. A prophet received God's inspired revelation. Preachers and teachers interpret and proclaim what God has already put into writing, but a prophet received direct revelation from God. And that's the difference there. If I stood before you today and I said that I have met people who have the gift of prophecy today, then I would be wrong on so many theological points. But one of the simplest and clearest points comes to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8, and we were just in it where we have very clearly, very plainly seen that this gift will be done away when the perfect comes, which is the completed word of God. Um, There are guys that will dance around that to try to prove their points. I was reading a book by a guy who uh, takes the position that prophets are for today, and he danced all all around that text, all around verse 8. But it's very clear. It has a very temporal nature. It will be done away when the perfect comes. Well, that concludes these two gifts. And in our next lesson, we're going to highlight the gifts of evangelist and that of pastor teacher. But today we have learned after studying the gifts of prophets and apostles, we've learned this, that it is the purpose of God to reveal himself through the word rather than beyond the word. It is the purpose of God to reveal himself through the word rather than beyond the word. So we're going to pick it up in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, where we saw um, apostles and prophets. And by the way, you have apostles and prophets in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, and Paul's writing that to the church, but that's also grouped in there with evangelists and pastor teachers. Why does he do that? Well, at the time, the um, apostles and the prophets were active at that time when he wrote that, but What you find in Ephesians 4.11, what Paul lists, what he lists there are speaking gifts. They're speaking gifts. And there is a reason for that, that that he would list those speaking gifts to that church. Unfortunately, many take the road that promises something more from self proclaimed apostles. And prophets, but that path will lead you away from the blessings of God and the life that He has called you to live within the church. If someone claims to have the gift of an apostle or prophet today, it is a counterfeit gift. And that's just how subtle Satan works. He can take a gift that was being given to the church in the past by God and turn that gift around to sow confusion within the body of Christ today. It's interesting. Uh, what the Apostle Paul would write in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 and 14, the Apostle Paul says, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of who? Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Are there deceitful workers out there? You'd better believe it. There are deceitful workers out there, and Paul says, watch out for them. Stay away from them. I was uh, watching a YouTube video recently where the guy speaking uh, was really smooth. He could really carry himself in a conversation, and as he is speaking, he's just using verse after verse. It sounded really good. The problem was, the verses he had been using, he, had, he was butchering the passages that he had used. we got to be so careful. Just because something sounds good doesn't mean that it is biblical. doesn't mean that it's biblical. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you praise and we thank you uh, for these moments that we've had. Uh, thank you for um, the, these gifts that at one time uh, were played a major role in the foundational period of the church within this church age of grace. Uh, Thank you that as believers today, we can study these and learn uh, about the foundational period of the church and grow in our understanding of that. Uh, And uh, Father, uh, be sharpened in our understanding of it as well. I pray that 
uh, we will uh, grow in discernment as uh, you, w- you would have us to grow, and we will thank you for that. Father, if any are here today or listening online and they don't have a relationship with you, help them to know that a relationship begins with Jesus Christ. Uh, we have a great need, uh, our sin, and Jesus Christ did all the work for us. He took our sin upon himself, went to the cross, bore the sin of the world on himself, and three days he died and three days later rose again, offering new life to any who will believe in him. Father, if any are here today or listening online have never made that decision to trust in Jesus Christ as Savior to save them from their sin, which would condemn them from, an eternal, from spending eternity in a place called hell, very sobering, I pray that you would help them to see their need and to place their faith in Jesus Christ. And we will thank you for that. We give you praise. In your name I pray. Amen.